beautiful. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, music team. Good morning. How y'all doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> How's your mom and them? <laughs> As you see, I'm warming up just fine to the south. Of doing just fine. <laughs> uh, take a deep breath. Ah. Oh. We just began with a moment of gratitude for the presence of this place this day, for you and for me, for everyone with us, for everyone joining us online. I um, want to send our love to everyone who's connecting. I know that you had many choices of where you could be this morning. Um, I know that because we gathered here last night uh, with someone special um, who got snared in some traffic uh, around the many choices that are in Atlanta uh, this weekend. <laughs> Football, I got one text that said we're stuck in some football traffic, some, something about Alabama and Duke or something. <laughs> then a little while later, we're still waiting, we're still waiting, and a little while later, uh, oh, there's a Dragacon traffic. <laughs> Dragacon traffic. And a little while later, we're still waiting, still waiting, and then said, uh, there's some pride, but is, is it pride? And I said, no, pride's in October in Atlanta. I said, no, no, it's black pride. Oh, black pride. Black pride's <laughs> happening. Dragacon, football, uh, Caribbean festival of some kind. Anyway, lots of different things. But we had a, a really wonderful gathering here last night of New Thought clergy uh, and Marianne Williamson. Uh, and so it goes again to choices that you have. Uh, thank you for being here today. She's speaking this morning at Hillside uh, International Chapel. Uh, don't leave. Sit down. <laughs> you, you're not going to make it. So just. <laughs> You've chosen well. Um, but she wanted um, a private gathering uh, with clergy, um, a clergy that she's familiar with and the movement she, that she's familiar with. And we had a wonderful conversation. And one of the things I really took away from it was uh, about the value that we have uh, and the opportunity we have in our communities to create space for what I would call the, the, the both and, the conversation of the both and rather than the either or. Right? It's very easy to get polarized and to, to be uh, you know, in the extreme of, of either side, either uh, to the left or to the right. Uh, but what we have in our theology uh, and in our principles of love and inclusion and allness and the wholeness and oneness is to harness those principles and, and the articulation of them, of them in a way that creates a space for a both and, that creates a space for... Uh, that, 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 that oneness doesn't mean sameness. Right? As we celebrate diversity and inclusivity, we know that oneness doesn't mean sameness. And so we can have a space where we can disagree and still love each other. And, and the challenge that, that I heard in our conversation with us last night was that if, if New Thought folks can't do it, if New Thought leaders can't hold the, create and hold the space for that, then who in the heck is going to? Because nobody else is doing it. Right? If, if we can't muster up the courage to do it, then how's it going to get done? Right? So she uh, impressed upon us, you know, don't, don't fall into that uh, divide of us and them and liberal and conservative. There are good values in liberal tradition. There are good values in conservative traditions. Um, and we hold the space for a both-and conversation uh, and to remember to put love first. Amen? Amen. So it was a wonderful thing. And... and uh, now, none of that is about my sermon today, so let me start the clock over. Okay, good. Our theme, so somebody, last night, we were here for a while last night, and somebody said, well, you have lots of fodder for the morning, and I said, yeah, but the theme is on, not completely different, so, but we know it's all one. Uh, our theme for the month of September is about stewardship. Uh, you know that through the Centers for Spiritual Living and uh, our theme of, of um, uh, uh, spirituality in action, uh, in looking at the prophetic justice principles uh, by Reverend James Forbes, the next justice principle in our theme is ensuring stewardship of our planet. So we'll focus throughout the month of September on stewardship and ecology and how we bring our principles to ensuring the stewardship of the planet. And the theme today and the principle that we've married with that stewardship is the principle of love principle of love. And so today I want to talk about love, 
I want to talk about dominion, and I want to talk about east of Eden. Love, dominion, and east of Eden. Are you ready? Let's talk about love. So we begin, all things begin in love, the principle of love. Uh, Ernest Holmes called love the, described love as a spiritual principle as the infinite self-givingness of spirit to its own creation. I love that, right? The infinite self-givingness of spirit to its own creation. In other words, the, the infinite intelligence of the universe so loved itself that it gave of, it not only gave, but gives, the infinite self-givingness, gives, gave and continues to give to its own creation. Why? So that it might know itself. So that it might know itself as you. So that it might know itself as me. So that it might know itself as the, the fauna and the beauty of the earth. So, so that it might know itself as the infinite creativity and diversity and inclusivity. So that it might know itself as all things seen and unseen and continues to create love the infinite self-givingness of creation to its creation Holmes says that love points the way and law makes the way possible love points the way in other words love is about intention so when we talk about love in terms of creation there's an intentionality in the universe to to create out of itself and that, that intentionality is for I would say that intentionality is wholeness right because it wouldn't be very loving for the, the the creator and when I say the creator I'm not talking about a, a man or an in particular being I'm talking about the infinite creative nature of the universe the infinite intelligence um, when the infinite intelligence of the universe creates I don't think it was very loving for uh, a creator to create something and then not intend for that thing to be fulfilled. Right? It doesn't make sense. So all of creation must have an intention behind it, and that intention is a loving intention. That intention is infused with love. That intention is, is wholeness, that you might come into being and know yourself. I like to say all things in the universe are on purpose, in purpose, and with purpose. You are on purpose, in purpose, and with purpose. You've been created in purpose with a purpose and on a purpose. And that purpose is to discover and to know yourself, to know the love that has brought you here, to know the love that you are, to unfold in that wholeness. So love points the way. And then law makes the way possible. So there are a set of principles, there are a set of ideas, there are a set of, of cause and effect and consciousness and what we think about comes about and all those sorts of ideas that, that, that we come to discover over time as the laws of consciousness that help articulate, shape, and guide our path in discovering the love that, of who we are. Are you with me so far? Yes. So love points the way. Law makes the way possible. Holmes in the Science of Mind text says, the heart is the center of divine love and perfect circulation. Its action is harmonious, vital, adequate, and complete. There is no false action, no wrong action. The pulsation of life, the pulsations of life are steady, unceasing and perfect. Let not your heart be troubled. Love is at the very center of our being, and the calm, continuous pulsation of life governs everything. So creation is a manifestation of the infinite love of God, the infinite intelligence of the universe, seeking to know itself as you and as me. And what's interesting about the creation story in, in the Hebrew scriptures and the Torah, which by the way, you know, I, I, since I'm still new here, I still find myself explaining myself sometimes. Um, so, you know, I, I sometimes have to explain, yes, I use, I use the Bible a lot um, because I find it so rich with story. And I used to sort of defend myself as a New Thought Christian, but the more I study and the more I learn, the more I grow, I, I realize that I spend a lot of time in the Torah uh, in the Jewish scriptures, and I realize that maybe I'm not a New Thought Christian, maybe I'm a New Thought Rabbi. Uh, so, maybe more more Jewish influence in there. So, I'm a New Thought Jew, which means I'm newish. Um, but that's uh, that's terrible. Don't don't repeat that. Don't. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Put that online. All of you watching online. Hashtag newish. 
But there's, there's a story, this story of creation is a love story. It's, it's not an articulation of what actually happened. Right? It's not, it's not uh, as I like to say, the scriptures are not stenography notes. <laughs> there was not something. Right? Moses was not like, could you read that back to me? When... No, no. <laughs> right? They're love stories. And they're, and, they're, and they're stories of consciousness that, that, that attempt to explain who we are, where we've come from, and they're ancient, and they're, and they're mixed with uh, a diversity of culture and path and backgrounds and, and tribes and nations uh, through generations and through millennia. And they're all wrapped together in this poetic and beautiful way. So the creation story... And all creation stories of all sacred texts are love stories. And what's interesting about the one in Genesis is that the creation story isn't complete until humanity is made. There's, there's a rhythm that happens in the first couple chapters of Genesis. And, and God says, and there was, or I would say God, the infinite intelligence of the universe, right? The infinite intelligence of the universe says, and there was, or and there is, and then it says night and then day. It's interesting that the cycle of the days doesn't begin with sunrise, right? The rhythm in the text is there was night and then there was day. Completion of the first day begins in the dark. Creation, come on somebody, creation begins in the dark and then comes into light of consciousness. It begins in the shadow. It begins in the dark places and then comes out. And we see that pattern over and over again. And then God is pleased, well pleased. Not just pleased, but well pleased. Over and over and over again. But then it's not complete until it brings forward humanity. Not man, not Adam. That's actually much later in Genesis and a completely different story from a different uh, tribe. But in the first chapter it says this uh, and then God or the infinite creation creativity creative energy of the universe says uh, let us make let us did you catch that I didn't even get three sentence three words into the sentence let us who's us the infinite intelligent the energies the creative energies, plural, male, female, uh, non-binary, the infinite creative energies. Because you know to create something, you got to be more than one thing. Where are you today? <laughs> to create something, go ahead, try to create something by yourself. Now, you want to create another human being, you better get with somebody else. <laughs> Or something, I don't care, create something else. You want to create a cake, you better have more than eggs. <laughs> right? You got to bring some different things together. So the different things of the universe, the, 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 all the things, the creative energies of the universe, let us create man, humanity, in our image. Let us, the infinite, plural energies of the universe, create man or humanity in our likeness, in our image, in our likeness. And then it says, let them uh, rule or have dominion, depending on the translation, over the fish and the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the, all of the earth and on all of the creatures that move on the ground. And then it says, God or the infinite created man in its own image and the image and likeness he created them. Uh, this is a terrible translation, this NIV, what they call the non-inspired version. Um, I just, but it's a student Bible, and so it's, I, I like it for a lot of other reasons. You got to have a, if you're a minister, you got to have a lot of different Bibles. There's a lot of different translations. Uh, thankfully, there's apps for that now. You can look up all the different language translations. God created humanity in its own image, in the image and likeness. He created him. Male and female, he created them both. Male and female at the same time, brought forth. That's in First Genesis. The story of Adam doesn't come till much later. And then Eve after that and all that. It's a completely different story from a different tribe. The first story talks about humanity coming forward at the same time. And so there's something about, and then the, the point of that is that then the story goes on from there to talk about the dominion. 
So I said today we're going to talk about love, we're going to talk about dominion, and we're going to talk about east of Eden. And so the dominion that is given, the infinite creative of the energies find it necessary in order to bring the process of creation to completion, to create something that is in its image and then endow that thing with dominion over its creation. This is what I call the babysitter effect. <laughs> the babysitter effect. Let me explain myself. First of all, dominion is much better translated as stewardship. There's all kinds of different ways, protection, supervision, attention, custody, uh, guardianship, all of these different ways. The, the, when, when the stories get written down, there's a reason that they're writing in this kind of level of control and ruling because they're trying to justify some of their own behavior, but we don't have time for that today. Um, you under, just understand when the story's written makes a difference, right? Uh, so let's talk about the babysitter effect. Now, when now I have a, a two-year-old going on 10, <laughs> right? And so, and my wife and I, we just had our anniversary, and we like, you know, we like to go out and have ourselves a good time. And thankfully, we have a situation where we're blessed with a teenager, a toddler and a teenager, teenager at the same time. God loves me. <laughs> right? We are blessed and highly favored. And the, and the good news in that is that we have this built-in babysitter, right? But... Uh, <laughs> Who, 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 who has a reasonable rate um, <laughs> and a bill pay reminder system that would blow your mind, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Be having breakfast and you say, you know you owe me $30. <laughs> like a pop-up notification, you know. <laughs> And the beautiful thing about when you entrust someone, if I were to go outside of the family and bring in a babysitter, if we were going to go out at night, you would say to the babysitter, you would say, now this is my beloved, this is my child, this is my creation. Where is the dominion in the relationship? It's with the parent. Parent has dominion, has guardianship, has stewardship of that which it has created. But the parent has said, no, we're going to go over here and do this for a little while. So I'm bringing you in. And for this period of time, I would like you to have dominion. I can just use that highly misused word in this text uh, for a moment. Dominion over the child. Now, your job as the babysitter is to act and serve in a way that is in the image and likeness of me. To have stewardship over the child in the image and likeness of me, in my place, to represent me, to love and to care and to nurture and to tend to the child's needs in the way that I would had I been there. You understand? The babysitter effect. Nowhere in that relationship would you think, if you were the parent going out, that when you came home, would you expect that the babysitter had taken dominion and run with that and decided to abuse your child, decided to, to uh, 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 manipulate your child into doing things that served the babysitter at the cost of their own safety or at the cost of their own health or at the cost of their own... Would you expect that? Would you expect the babysitter to, 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 uh, to, to force the child into any kind of situation that wouldn't be for its highest good, particularly if it was only for the good of the babysitter themselves? Would you consider that a very good babysitting job? So when God gives humanity dominion and has created humanity in its image and likeness, it's saying, I have created this precious thing. And I'm putting you in charge. You are me. You are my image and likeness. You are my steward. You are my hands. You are my feet. This is not yours to control, to manipulate for your own good. This is for you to watch over 
as if I was watching over it, because I am watching over it, because I created you. Yes. Oh, and by the way, this is just a little extra on the babysitter effect. By the way, the thing which you are given stewardship of and stewardship over is that from which you came. In case I need to remind you, I actually took the, the dust of this thing and breathed into it and created you. So the thing that you're stewarding is actually that which you came from. So be mindful about how you treat it because you're going to return to it one day. Right? So it's a, the stewardship is a reciprocal relationship. And so love and dominion are about the reciprocal relationship that we have with the earth. Are you following what I'm saying? And so maybe the story of Adam and Eve leaving the garden isn't a story about sin. Maybe it's a story about understanding our nature of stewardship. Maybe it's a story about understanding our relationship with the whole. Maybe it's a story, in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a piece there that says, uh, um, right, you remember, oh, this translation cracked me up this morning. I was reading this and I just laughed out loud. Um, and it's, you know the story, God goes looking for Adam and Eve. They have eaten the forbidden fruit. And he says, and then man and his wife are heard off in the sound, and the Lord God was looking for them in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from that tree that I told you not to eat from? This is the part that made me laugh. We don't have time to go into this today, but I just have to share it in this translation, which is a terrible translation. Uh, but it says, and the man said, that woman. <laughs> right? Now, you know a man wrote that. It gets better. It says, that woman you put here. <laughs> that didn't even answer the question. Yeah. Did you eat of that tree I told you not to eat by? That woman you put here. But I know we'll break that down some other day. That's not today. But I invite you to consider that the sin is not the eating of the fruit. The sin is the hiding from God in the first place. It's the thinking that you were separate from the divine. That's what God got upset. I couldn't find you. I was looking for you. I couldn't find you. That, I, that's why I'm concerned. And now I just want to know why you were hiding. And are you hiding because you, you did that thing I told you not to do? And there's a, a, a thread within the context of the Bible that over and over and over again that is this parent dynamic, which is the divine telling its creation not to do something and its creation constantly doing it, <laughs> right? Which all parents understand, right? Don't touch that. I told you not to touch that. Please don't touch that. Why are you touching that? I told you, if you touch that, I'm going to... Oh, okay. right? Over and over and over again, Right? That's dad. That's a classic story, right? When dad leaves the garage, don't touch my tools. What's the first thing you do when that car turns that corner? <laughs> Touching the tools. That's why we have Nest cameras nowadays. <laughs> so I believe that the, the original sin is not the eating of the fruit. It's the thinking you're separate from God in the first place, the hiding. God says, why are you hiding from me? Because I've given you dominion over this thing. Why are you? So, so the story of Adam and Eve is not a story uh, about sin and having to leave the garden. It's a story about what happens when we think ourselves separate and the growing up that we have to do. There is a process within conscious development. I studied child development. And that was my major in college. And there's a process that we have to go through, that our brains biologically have to go through, that's very important for our psychological and physiological well-being, and that's called self-differentiation. 
We have to think ourselves separate in order to come into our identity, right? We want our child to love us and to be close to us. We want, like God, we want to look in the garden and find them there, but one day they're going to say no, and they're going to say mine, and they're going to do all those things, and we're going to say, oh, I miss the days when you just cuddle up and just lay on my chest and just, right? But if it did that all the time, then there wouldn't be any growth. That's not a child, that's a puppy. Even the puppy grows up, right? <laughs> all right. Love, dominion, and east of Eden. So there's a story that comes after Adam and Eve. And it's a story of Cain and Abel. And before I under tell you a little bit about the story, that you probably know, but I hold, invite you to hold your suspicions about where I'm going with this. I invite you to consider the context in which the story is written. Because again, these texts are not stenographer notes. Uh, they're not happening in real time. As best biblical scholars can tell nowadays, uh, the story of Genesis, which by the way was not the first book. The first book is actually written while, uh, while they're in exile. And it is the story of Exodus. It's the story of their liberation. But while they're in the story of their liberation, they're trying to capture uh, that story. And it'd be through oral traditions. Then a little while later, they say, you know, we should probably go back and say where we came from. And so Genesis, as best we know, is written in the 5th to 6th century uh, BCE, which is a time in which they are in exile again. When they are, when Nebuchadnezzar has, has destroyed the temple and kicked them out of Jerusalem. And so they've had hundreds of years now, five, six hundred years of rule, and they've gone through King David and King Solomon and, and the prophets and, and have built empires and cities and, and amassed wealth and, and done all of these things. And now they have to explain and try to come to terms with how did we get here again? How did we get enslaved? How did we get overthrown? How did we get, how did we lose everything we had? How did this happen again? And so there's a representation that's told about Cain and Abel. And what we're uh, told is that Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. And all that we're told about them is that Abel is an animal herder and Cain was a tiller of the soil. In other words, Abel um, was a, a, a nomadic uh, herder or, far, or, or a, a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer, a settler, agriculture. Uh, and what we know is that in human history, there was a time and a period in which uh, those two worlds had to collide with each other. When there was a shift from being nomadic and roaming around and following and being in relationship with the earth and the animals, and if the herd moved, then you moved, and, and if the water dried up, then you moved, and if the earth shifted in this way, then you shifted in that way, and you were in close relationship with the dynamics of the stewardship of the earth. But then we learned how to till the soil and to cultivate the ground and to capture the water and bring it to us instead of us going to it and to doing all of these things and then to store up food and to keep it uh, for winter and eat things that wouldn't necessarily be in season but we grew so much of it because we got so good at the process. You following what I'm saying? Yes. Farming and agricultural society and the establishment of that society, if you can imagine for just a moment, at some point in time probably had to clash with the going away of the nomadic herding society. In other words, the herds were probably trying to follow and do their thing and found themselves coming upon your land and your farm and you saying, you can't do that here. Well, why not? I've always, we've always done it. We've always come this way to follow the herd. You can't do that now because you're going to hurt my crops. And so there's a clash between these two stories. And so, uh, uh, ways of, of being in the world. And so there's a clash between the two sons. And it's said that Cain comes first in the birth order, which makes sense because, again, the writer would be more familiar with the farming society, the agricultural society, than the nomadic society. 
And the murder that takes place, that Cain kills Abel, kills off the nomadic way of being in preference for the farming or agricultural way of being. And Abel's blood hits the ground and God cries out and says, why have you done this? I have heard the cry. There's a, there's a word, a Jeru uh, uh, Hebrew word, sa'ak, which is the sound that the blood makes when it hits the ground and it's this ache, this ache. Why have you done this? And there's a punishment that God gives to Cain, and he says, and this is very interesting, he says uh, that you should be uh, cursed for this murder and forced to wander the earth, to wander the earth. And when you till the land, it will bring forth no food, for you have to wander the earth. I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. What is it about wandering that allows us, now, let's see, that's an interesting thing to say to a farmer, right? Because God says, you have to wander the earth, that's your punishment, and when you till the soil, it will bring forward no food. That's a strange thing to say to a farmer. Well, if I till the soil, and the rains come, and I've planted the seed, then it's going to produce a seed. I know the law. But love points the way, and law makes the way possible. Do you remember that? Love points the way. So the covenant is twofold. The covenant that we have with humanity has two parts to it. Love points the way. Love is the intention. Law makes the way possible. Perhaps the story is trying to tell us that if you're out of step with the first part of the covenant, you can't follow through on the second part of the covenant. Cain would have said, I know the law. I know that if I plant the seed and I water, then the ground will produce food for me to eat. But God is saying, when you do that, it's not going to do anything. Why? Because you're out of step with the first part. Love pointing the way. You have forgotten the energy of love. You have not put love first. And because you haven't done that, your, your reaping and sowing will do no good. And so you have to wander the earth. Now, if I had more time, I would develop that a little bit further, but what you should know is that wandering the earth becomes a spiritual practice that we see over and over and over again in the text. When Moses commits a murder and is afraid for his life and has to escape Egypt, he does what? He wanders and he becomes a herder again. He becomes a sheep herder. And it's in his wandering and herding lifestyle uh, that he finds God, he finds Sinai, and has his experience with the divine. In his process of liberating his people, they have to leave and do what? Wander for a long time. And we see it over and over and over again. Why? Because there's something about reconnecting with the stewardship of the earth to putting love first and remembering from whence we came. The thing that you have been given dominion over is that which you came from. And if you forget that, you can't bring any fruit forward into your life. Now, what's interesting in the story is that Cain ignores God. Cain goes to a place east of Eden, into the land of Nod, which means a distant place east of Eden. He meets up with his wife and has some children and establishes a city. In other words, the establishment of civilization comes from Cain ignoring God's command. Watch this now. I know you're saying, where in the world is he going? I'm going to get you to brunch in just a second. Hang on. <laughs> Cain ignores God's command to wander the earth, and he goes and he establishes civilization. And out of that comes the kingdoms, out of that comes farming, out of that comes agriculture, out of that comes the development of uh, uh, amassing riches and resources and, and all of the stuff that happens for hundreds of years the, with the tribe of Israel until they find themselves in exile again and they're having to reconcile, how did this happen? How did we get here again. What did we miss? And they begin to write the Genesis story. 
not as a narrative of history, but as a remembrance of an oral tradition that says we have forgotten something fundamental to who we are. There is a covenant that is established with all of humanity, and that covenant says put love first. Love points the way, but the law makes the way possible. You can be right with the law, but out of step with love, and you're not going to produce anything. We forgot it back then, and we, we produced all of this kingdom and all of this good, but here we find ourselves in exile again. Why? Because we missed a very important step. Wander back in the desert. Our path to liberation came through Moses through wandering. Our path to liberation came through our own wandering in the desert. Our path to liberation comes through wandering. Why? Poet laureate... Um, contest uh, next week. This would be some inspiration from you. This is from uh, one of my favorites, David White. What do I do? What do you do when you are lost in the forest? What do you do when you're lost in the forest? Stand still. The trees ahead and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here, and you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know it and to be known. The forest breathes. Listen. It answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, Here, no true trees are same to raven. No true branches are same to wren. If what a tree or a branch does is lost on you, then surely you are lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. What do I do when I'm lost in the forest? Stand still. The trees and the bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. You must treat it as a powerful stranger. You must ask permission to know it and to be known. The forest breathes. Listen. It answers, I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, here. No two trees are same to raven. No two branches are same to wren. If what a tree or a branch does is lost on you, then surely you are lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Perhaps this is what God was asking Cain to remember. You must wander. You must find yourself again in the rhythm of the sacred nature that I have created, this thing that I have given you stewardship of. You have become lost, and you must let it find you. From our book of the month this month, Spiritual Ecology, The Cry of the Earth, the author says, it is only through awakening to an awareness of the sacredness of creation and of its relationship to our own sacred nature that we be can begin to right the primal imbalance that lies at the root of our present pre predicament. Any awareness of the world as living as a living whole needs to include its sacred dimension. Otherwise, any attempt we make at healing what has gone so wrong will just be treating the symptoms and ignoring the underlying cause. What happens when we are disconnected from our root chakra? What happens when we're disconnected from the feminine nature of the earth? We can feel the orphaned and the motherless. The masculine presence dominates. We look for security in material things. Individual relationships prevail over connected relationship. Selfishness and triumph over family and social responsibility. When we're disconnected from the root, it disrupts everything. And God says to Cain, you violated the first covenant. You must wander so that you get connected again. Love, dominion, and east of Eden. We put love first. We remember that the dominion that we've been given is a dominion of stewardship over all of creation, to be in right relationship as the presence of God, as the face of God, as the hands of God. I've given you my precious creation, and out of this pre precious creation, I created you. And now you are to be in relationship with this thing so that my face is reflected in it everywhere. And if you forget and you wander to a place called East of Eden, 
you will have to come back and find yourself here again. Let's pray together. I invite the practitioners to stand and join me in consciousness as they simply connect with the breath and you connect with the breath and we connect together, our friends on Facebook and YouTube who are watching us wherever they are, connect with the breath in this moment. And we remember that there is a divine presence, a divine life, one power, one life of all that is called the creation of the universe. It is the love intelligence. It is the dynamic vibration of wholeness that is seeking expression through you and through me. This one life is having its way in its being as your intelligence, as my intelligence, as the mind of God right now. And we articulate this mind in such a way as to bring us into a love covenant relationship, a remembrance of who and what we are. That we are manifestations of this divine intelligence and have been given stewardship of this beloved space called earth, called each other, called the sacred ground on which we walk, called the beautiful earth in which we live. Let us so be in relationship with this thing that it is alive to us. It is living and breathing and we tend and care for it as our own and we feel rising within us the sacred duty and obligation that we've been given to breathe and to be in harmony with the divine in all of its forms and expressions. This is stewardship of the earth and all creation. This is our focus this month. This is our duty and obligation in this moment. And out of this reunion of covenant relationships, something wonderful happens. All of our needs are met because we are not lost. We have not left the garden. Oh, we only left the garden in our mind, but the garden is all around us. The garden of infinite supply, the garden of abundant health, the garden of right relationship, the garden of divine employment. It is all around us in this moment. And as we remember it, it makes itself known in our conscious awareness and in our daily activity. I speak this word for this community, for all spiritual communities, wherever they are gathered to or more, to bring and to highlight the divine good of God into the awareness of humanity. I bless every temple, every sacred ashram, every uh, synagogue, every church, every mountain place, every valley, every living room, every gathering place of two or more. And I bless the spiritual living center of Atlanta, knowing that it is a divine idea in the mind of God, is here to do a great and mighty work to awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence, and therefore has everything that it requires for the fulfillment of its good, and that includes every member that calls this place home, for we are one, we are part of this living, breathing thing. And for this, and so much more, I do give thanks. I release this word, and I simply allow it to be... <sighs> calling it good and very good. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you. Peace and blessings.